Excellent. Okay. Okay, so good evening. I'm Rhonda Osmond of the League of Women Voters of Colorado Task Force on Gun Violence Prevention. And tonight I'd like to remind us all that the League of Women Voters is a nonpartisan grassroots nonprofit dedicated to empowering everyone to fully participate in our democracy. The League neither advocates for nor opposes candidates or parties. Our leagues advocate and educate to ensure that every Coloradan has the freedom, confidence, and information they need to vote. Tonight, I'm welcoming Rita Schweitz of Colorado Ceasefire, who will speak to us about extreme risk protection orders. Rita's been a board member of the Colorado Ceasefire for more than 20 years. She's volunteered with Ceasefire to strengthen Colorado's gun violence prevention laws and to defeat bills that would have made Colorado less safe. She has worked to support state candidates who support gun safety efforts and to strengthen the effectiveness of Colorado Ceasefire. Before she retired, Rita facilitated strategic planning meetings for nonprofit organizations, including the United Nations. Colorado Ceasefire is the longest serving statewide grassroots gun violence prevention organization in the state of Colorado. The organization comprises parents, teachers, students, community members, gun violence survivors, and more who've been working for nearly 20 years to prevent and reduce gun violence in Colorado through education, research, and legislative advocacy. Colorado Ceasefire was formed in 2000 as a political action committee after the Colorado General Assembly failed to pass meaningful gun violence prevention laws following the Columbine High School's mass shooting. The organization formed a 501c4 Colorado Ceasefire Legislative Action shortly thereafter and focused their efforts on advocating for common sense gun legislation that would prove to make a significant impact on reducing gun violence in our homes and communities. In December of 2015, the organization added an educational and outreach branch, Colorado Ceasefire Outreach, a 501c3, to spread awareness of the dangers of gun violence and the ways we can minimize harm. Tonight, Beth Hendricks, the Executive Director of the Colorado League, is here to sort out our participants and make sure we zoom smoothly. I'll share my screen with Rita's slides, and we ask that you put all the questions in the chat, and we'll address them after Rita's talk. I welcome Rita Schweitz. Thank you very much, and thanks to all of you for attending and wanting to learn more and helping spread the word about the uh, extreme risk protection order, what it means, how we how it can help make Colorado safer. And we'll start with the slides. Right, and I will share my screen. Okay. Well, as you just heard, Colorado Ceasefire has been around for more than 20 years. We've worked really hard for freedom from gun violence and uh, we continue to work and work with other groups and and the league and other people. So thanks for being here. And next slide, please. Just really quickly, I think we've just heard this slide. <laughs> thanks. You can just move it, move along. Uh, so our mission and vision to reduce gun violence in Colorado through education, outreach, and legislative advocacy. And that's our three branches, basically. And uh, what we want to see, and we all want to see, is a state free from gun violence. Next, please. So this is what we've been doing and continue to do um, to reduce gun violence through education, outreach, and legislative advocacy to strengthen gun safety laws. And we've just seen uh, some of those in the session that just ended that reduce preventable injuries and deaths and to encourage responsible gun ownership. Next, please. Today, I'm gonna to talk about the extreme risk protection order. Some people know it as red flag orders. The other way I know it is ERPO which for the letters. And it is uh, a one of the many violence prevention tools for Colorado. And clearly we need more. And this one's a pretty important one. So let's learn some more about it. Thank you. Next. So what is extreme risk? I imagine that everybody on this uh, Zoom 
has in your own mind what an extreme risk is. And there is no one answer to this, but let's explore together what is meant by this law, what this law is supposed to cover. Next, please. So here's an extreme, a situation of an extreme risk that unfortunately occurred before we had uh, ERPA law. And probably all of you remember this, especially if you've been in Colorado for a while. So there, there was a man at the uh, University of Colorado in Denver or, or at Anschutz, and he was disturbed enough to be treated by a counselor that spoke of warning to harm people, but not specifically didn't say who he wanted to harm, just he wanted to harm people. The counselor was very concerned, informed the campus police, who unfortunately could not do anything because this man was not breaking any laws at that time. And there was, there was no way that legally the police could have done anything. And um, so nothing was done. And we know that on July 20th in that theater, 12 people were killed and 70 wounded in a very short time, minutes. So that was an extreme risk situation that had we had a red flag or an ERPO law and had somebody known how to access it might have been prevented. Next, please. So that was 2012. In 2013, in the legislative session, there were five gun violence prevention laws that were passed. Many of you might remember what happened then. The uh, Rocky Mountain gun owners tried to and successfully recalled the, the head of the Senate, John Morse, and Angie Heron from Pueblo, and they would have uh, recalled the third person who was Evie Hudak, but she resigned before she could be recalled so that the Democrats kept their majority, but the majority was not very big, enough to pass these gun laws, and then the, the gun com gun rights community just decided they didn't have to uh, let that happen. And so they recalled three people, which was really a blow. And people, even in this session that just ended, someone said, do you remember 2013 when there was talk about some conversation about legislation? Next, please. So in 2017, ceasefire uh, formed um, an, inv an invited and uh, forum on behavioral risk. We were in touch with people around the country. Red flag laws or ERPA laws were beginning to be passed or at least talked about. And in anticipation of presenting a bill about behavioral risk and about on ERPO, we gathered together law enforcement, legislators, government people, a gun violence prevention community, and medical and mental health to talk about and learn about these um, red flag laws and how it connected to behavioral risk. So that was in 2017. Next. The following year, at, on New Year's evening, um, the Douglas County Sheriff's Department received a, a call to respond to a dangerous situation, disturbance in a home. Uh, of more than one sheriff's officers, but including Zachariah Parrish III, immediately went to that home and as soon as the door opened, the shooter, in a matter of seconds, shot all of the officers and killed De Deputy uh, Parrish. The shooter's mother had tried to take his guns away, and he had threatened her. 
and threatened to sue her and threatened to harm her. She, of course, did nothing about it. She couldn't do anything at that point and uh, watched in horror and found out in her what happened in her home. And I mean, it just imagine a mother who had tried to prevent this and it didn't and that was unsuccessful in preventing. So that was December 31st, 2017. Next, please. Colorado ceasefire, along with, of course, along with some legislators, introduced the extreme risk protection order in 2018. The legislature was not in the mood and did not uh, was not comprised of the people who enough people who would support this law. So it did not pass in 2018. However, after the election, it did pass, I mean, it was pre presented again, introduced again, and it did pass in 2019. And so up until uh, I think about two weeks ago, we had our first version of the extreme risk protection order. And let's look at the next slide. So now, We know from looking at the risk situations we just talked about and that all of us know that families, doctors, teachers, law enforcement are, the are among the first to see warning signs of risky behavior to self and others. But until there was the first ERPA law in Colorado, there was very little that they could do about it. And that was the, the examples we just we just showed, and there are many more, unfortunately. Next slide. So ERPA was passed, and clearly there was a lot of testimony on both sides. The Rocky Mountain gun owners had their normal uh, routine of questioning and testifying any way they could. What's important to remember at the, that the ERPO is a civil action. It is not criminal. And it allows a select group of people. And it, as first passed up until two weeks ago, it allowed only law enforcement and family members to file a petition to the court to temporarily remove firearms from an individual and prohibit further access to firearms. Um, if they were deemed to pose a significant risk to themselves and others. And this law is written so that it's constitutional, even though testimony at the time claimed that it was not constitutional. Next, please. So this is what it does. So if someone is in crisis, and we, we have to remember that in Colorado and most of the rest of the country, more than half of the gun deaths are suicides. So in thinking about ERPO, think about suicides as well as homicides. So it re, this removes the gun, uh, person's access to, to guns. And hopefully at the same time, the person who had lost their guns temporarily uh, would be available, would be able to seek treatment, to stabilize their behaviors, to access resources, whatever would be necessary, so that that person would no longer pose a danger to self and others. Next. So, this is kind of behaviors that we see and we know um, lead to dangerous situations. Personal crises, that could be anything, um, especially when you think about homicides as well as suicide. So someone's lost their loved one for some reason or is sick and doesn't wanna live any longer or has a history of aggression and just domestic violence included um, demonstrable signs of being a threat 
and a history of violence, unsafe behavior with firearms, and a lot of talk about wanting to kill themselves or kill others. All of those are indications that a situation might need an ERPO. Next, please. So this, who can file an ERPO? So up until two weeks ago, it was only law enforcement and families. Um, the new ERPO bill, which happily was signed, in, it expands the petitioners to a lot of other people who know and have access to know that somebody needs help and needs to have their guns removed. So it includes, as it did before, law enforcement officers, including the Colorado Attorney General. This is new, um, and his de his or her designees, district attorney attorneys and their designees, licensed healthcare professionals, mental healthcare professionals, educators and school administrators, higher education faculty members, and household members. Now, to me, when I hear this list of, peti of possible petitioners, I think that's really inclusive and this is terrific because a lot of different people will have their eyes on dangerous situations. I also think, and I know the league thinks this too, is how are we going to, how are all of these people going to hear about ERPOs mm -hmm. and know, know when and how to use them? Because I could, I can imagine as a former teacher a long time ago, I might not be paying attention to all of a sudden I have the ability to file an ERPO. So just keep that in mind of the list of people who need to know about ERPO. Thanks, next slide. And household, as there was originally the household and law enforcement, this big, big encompassing definition of what defines a household. So rela relation by blood marriage or adoption, have a child in common, resided with a respondent. The respondent is the person who has the gun that needs to be removed. Uh, resided with the respondent in the last six months, are domestic partners, step parents, stepchildren, grandparents, grandchildren, legal garden, guardians, and uh, present or past married or unmarried couples. That's a big lot of people that can file uh, an ERPO. Next. So this is going to get into more detail about exactly how this works. So there's two types of ERPOs. There's a temporary, and that's the one we're going to talk about first. Um, the temporary ERPO is an urgent one that um, we need to get those gun, that gun or those guns away for, from a person ASAP. So the hearing will be done ex parte parte without notice to the respondent. And the hearing must occur within one court day of the filing of the petition. So that you can see, this is a hurry because it's really uh, critical. Now, the whole point of ERPO is that it has to go to court. It's not that law enforcement or anybody else can make the decision on temporary taking guns away for someone temporarily. It has to go to court and the judge has to find cause to, to implement an ERPO. A temporary ERPO is sometimes called a TERPO, but I don't know that that's exactly what it is, but it sort of is. Um, so if the, if the judge finds cause, Law enforcement will remove firearms and ensure that the respondent cannot legally purchase firearms. And that goes to background checks, which we have implemented in this state a long time ago. Um, the respondent must surrender his or her concealed carry permit. The respondent is informed of an upcoming hearing for consideration of a full ERPO. And if the temporary ERPO is issued it is valid for up to 14 days, at which time there would be the hearing for the next for the other type of ERPO. So 
Um, the first thing is that the guns are removed. And at that time, the person who owns the gun is informed of what's going on and that there's a court date coming up, et cetera. Okay, next slide. So the full year or final ERPO after 14 days, so there's the respondent was notified of the hearing and may have legal counsel at the state expense. This was a big issue in, in passing the, the initial law about providing uh, legal counsel to people. Um, and if the petitioner establishes risks to the self or others, the court may issue a full or continuing ERPO. And it's for a year and it is renewable. Um, and the respondent, who's the person who had had the guns, may appeal once during that one year period to get his or her guns back. Next slide, please. So here are the steps to obtaining an ERPO. To request a petition from a district or county court or go online and download at that address. Step two is to submit the petition to a district or county court in the county where the respondent lives. There's no fee attached and there are, quote, Sherlock's at the court um, to assist people who need assisting in filling out these forms. Sherlock um stands for self-help litigant coordinator so it's somebody at the court who works for the court cannot give legal advice but can help in a person file the form and one of the things we've learned in the last three years since the ERPO was was initiated in Colorado is that a lot of people have filed forms incorrectly and so they were thrown out and so unfortunately the issue was not resolved by an ERPO. Because, so we've learned and I'll show, we'll see the difference in the new law. Next, please. So um, this is sounds a little confusing, but it's where ERPO should, can be Filed. One of the prop things that we learned in the past three years is that people filed frequently in the wrong county or with the wrong court. And so then it was as though they didn't file anything. So um, this is just for family and household members can file in the county where either they or the other party resides. This is different than before. It had to be in only where the other person resides. In a county where either party is employed or in the county where the acts that this uh, about that the subject committed um, occurred. So family and household members can file in those three different ways. All the other petitioners, law enforcement, district attorney, educators, et cetera, have to file in the county of the respondents, that's the gun owner's residence. It's a little confusing, but it, it the, the new forms, I think, are still being uh, revised. And so I am hoping that the forms will be easier than last time, and this will be explained on the form. Next. If a person files a temporary er ERPO, as I said before, the court, court will hold a hearing in one court day and the petitioner must attend in person. There are a few situations where um, that petitioner can use a phone, but really that petitioner hopefully will be able to attend in person. And if the court issues the ERPO, the respondent, as we said before, must surrender firearms and um, concealed carry permit and cannot buy guns and um, is provided a list of behavioral health resources. 
So that's kind of like getting into the details of what happens. But next slide. This is new and really important. There's free legal support available for follow, filing ERPOs. So this is a 501c3 called Bridge to Justice, and it's Colorado, it's here, and it will provide legal services so that people who want to follow do them pro do it properly. Um, uh, send a consultation request by the QR code, which we all know about, and they will refer to other support services if they cannot directly support the situation. So this is really important that there's help in filing. As we all know, passing laws is only the beginning and enforcing them and making them accessible and workable has to follow. And this is really helpful. It's good to see this year. Next. So ERPOs at most are for one year and then they can be repeated when by going back to court and having the judge rule if the person can have his his or her guns returned or not. So after so say after the first year, after a year, um, and the judge says it's terminated, his his or her firearms are returned within three days. Um, and um, the and the NCIS background check system will be updated and the respondent may reapply for concealed carry permit. So this is all really important um, because we're not in the business of taking guns away from people. So it's temporary and rights are, the owner's rights are followed and everything goes back to the way they were before. Next slide, please. So looking at extreme risk laws, Connecticut passed the first one in 1999. And um, when I see that, which I see often, I think about Sandy Hook and that sad, sad situation in, in that elementary school. And they had an extreme risk protection order in Connecticut, but clearly the mother or the father who, or any, anybody, somebody might have known that this person posed a risk to self and others, but unfortunately nothing, nobody filed an extreme risk protection order. So then the next one was Indiana in 2004. And so far there are, I think 20, other states, including the District of Columbia, that have ERPOs. So, and what I'm hearing when I listen to the news and hear a, like Texas or some um, Alabama or a couple of other states, Tennessee, people are saying, some people are actually saying we need a red flag law. Not that they have one, or who knows whether they could get one, but people, especially in Tennessee and Kentucky, are really talking about this is what we need. So that's really important. It's a beginning. Next slide, please. When ERPO was first proposed in the legislature, of course, the opposite side had a lot of stuff to say about why this is not going to work. And um, so these are, these are what this is, is protection against abuse. So the petitioner must establish by a preponderance of evidence that the person poses a significant risk of injury to self or others. It's not like, I think that person might wanna hurt somebody or even he told me he wants to hurt other people. It has to be more specific and more detailed than that. And it has to be clear and convincing for the judge. The, peti the petitioner, the person who brings the ERPO must submit an affidavit signed under oath 
pe with penalty of perjury. So these are protections for the owners of the guns, and they're important. And when we think about all of this is in front of a judge, and depending on the county in Colorado, and depending on the politics in Colorado, some judges would be uh, able to follow, to, to say, yes, we need to file a year-long ERPO where there's clear and convincing evidence. And we have evidence, we, the state, has evidence that there are counties in which neither law enforcement nor the court really uh, believe in this, in the ERPO law. So depending on where it happens or where it's filed, it might or might not be successful in reducing harm. Next slide, please. So this, this is more about protecting the rights of the owner of the gun. Um, a person who files maliciously or false petitions may be subject to criminal prosecution or, uh, or civil liability. And this, uh, this is one of the things that, that the opposite side said in when the law was, when the bill was being considered that somebody who's mad at somebody else can just file an ERPO. That has almost never happened in Colorado and in, in the other states. It's very, very rare. There's there is one example that I know of that somebody ended up in jail for a while um, because she did file a malicious petition, but it's very rare. Um, there's no requirement to file a petition and nobody can be legally liable for avoiding follow, filing a petition. Um, so if somebody says, I didn't know I could, or I didn't think it was this bad, then nothing legally can happen. That person cannot be held liable for anything that happened because they did not file an ERPO. This is another protection about ERPOs. Um, And employers of people who do or do not file ERPOs cannot uh, discipline their employees based on filing or not filing um, ERPOs. So that, again, there's more, more protections built into this law. Next slide, please. This is new, actually. It hasn't happened yet, but it will be new. And it's part of the, the law that was signed two weeks ago. The Department of Public Safety is going to establish a hotline to receive and refer calls about ERPOs. This is terrific because they only work if people know about it and people feel comfortable filing or not filing and having a hotline is really important and this was part of the law that was just passed so we're very pleased that this is going to happen so the the new law expands the number of petitioners creates this hotline and and then that nonprofit group uh, also will help with filing that's what's ba the basis of the new law that just passed. Um, but as I said before, and as all of you know, it's going to take a lot of outreach and education so that the majority of people know about ERPO and will use it, can use it, and will use it if necessary. Next slide, please. So here are myths versus facts on ERPO. And some of these myths came from the Rocky Mountain gun owners and the gun rights community, unfortunately. And it's unconstitutional was a big one. Um, it's an infringement on the Second Amendment. But the fact is that the law has been challenged 
and held to be constitutional. And Justice Scalia way back uh, said that the second amendment is not unlimited. And so that's why it's constitutional. Uh, another myth, it doesn't provide due process. And we just saw, and I explained about the ex parte hearing and the uh, process, inclusion of due process protections. Um, and actually, uh, it's safer, especially for law enforcement and suicidal people, not to tip off people in advance. That's why the initial turpo happens without notification to the gun owner. Um, and it's the same as what's used in, in domestic violence protection orders. And next, and I just talked about um, it will not be abused because it's got to be evidence-based and a limited number of petitioners. It can't be a neighbor down the street. It has to be one of those people that falls in that category. Um, another myth is that there are taking people's guns away is a big deal. That is true. And that's why it has to go to the court and there are all those protections. And so some people say, well, just use the M1, the mental health holds, and that will provide some, somebody time, I guess, to um, get their life in order. And so they're no longer a danger to self or others. But M1 holds are far less than 24 hour holds. There's a limited number of beds. Frequently there's no M1 beds available and 72 hours usually is not enough to have people become safer. They just have too much going on. So that's a, another fact. And next please. This one, a long time ago, I was a sheriff's officer, so I look at this one and think and thought a lot about it when I first heard about ERPOs. Um, so here's the myth. Law enforcement will be blowing down doors to confiscate firearms or vice versa, in my mind. And the fact is, that's not what that's not what happens. There's a search warrant and officers are trained how to carry out the search warrant. Um, retrieving firearms put law officers at risk. That was my fear. And yes, it can. Of course, when you're going to, even a group of officers going to take someone's guns away, there's a potential risk. And we've seen that, unfortunately, with Officer Parrish. Um, but there's also a risk, and it might be greater if nothing at all is done. So yes, there's a risk. There's always a risk. Next. Um, when we talk about suicides, the myth is that, oh, if you take their guns away, they are going to commit suicide some other way. The fact is that 85% of attempts by gun, of suicide attempts by gun ends in death versus 5% of non-firearms. Attempt, firearm attempts. And um, the last is this won't stop all mass shootings and suicides. And that's true. It's not going to stop all of them, but this is one vital added tool for prevention. Next. So this is, this is what we know from the first three years of having an ERPO in Colorado. There were 380 petitions filed, the majority by law enforcement. Um, as I said before, citizens in the past were making more mistakes, and so theirs were not filed properly. They were filed for suicides, again, I mean, to prevent suicides, mass shootings, and domestic violence. And not surprisingly, Denver had the highest number of filings, but they were filed in 40 other 
counties. And here's the Second Amendment sanctuary counties that I men mentioned before. There are 38, you probably know this, 38, they call them Second Amendment sanctuary counties in Colorado. And when this law was first being considered, those 38 sheriffs said, we will never file ERPOs. And in fact, ERPOs have been filed in over half of them. How however, in, um, I think it's the next slide. Whoop. Now, I think we're down to um, slide 34. Let's see. Yeah. So we we all unfortunately know about many of these things. So the places where ERPOs should have been filed, we all wish had been filed in Colorado and the Boulder King Super shooting. I know some of you are in Boulder. And as you remember, the family knew that that person had mental Disabilities, in fact, had been once convicted, um, I think maybe convicted of, of a misdemeanor that should have meant he should not, could not have been able to buy guns, but that was lost somehow. And the family wished, did not know what to do. And we know what the result of that was. In the Denver Spree shooter in 2021, that person wrote a book or a pamphlet about killing people and then went and did it exactly as he said, starting at a apartment building near Cheeseman Park and then going to South Broadway and then going out to Lakewood. And in Colorado Springs, just recently, the family of the Q shooter also knew and other people knew that that person was talking about shooting up uh, a LGBTQ club. And of course that happened. Um, and this is the note down the bottom here says, the El Paso County Sheriff opposed the ERPO law and never filed any ERPOs. This is a problem when law enforcement is opposed to a law um, because there's there's nothing in the law that says that law that anyone has to file must file so those sheriffs and some police chiefs chiefs have the option of filing or not filing and some of them will never file so i think we have to talk about voting in order to change that situation Okay, next one, please. And this is, um, I, I mentioned this before, that um, in the past, the uh, law enforcement has had more success rate in filing ERPOs and having them implemented. And hopefully, in the future with the new law and the expanded help in filing and uh, hopefully outreach and education, um, citizens will be making fewer errors and being able, and not just citizens, but the other people like the educators and healthcare professionals, et cetera, will be as successful as law enforcement with the courts and with the judges. So the, the errors that we've seen in the last three years filed in the wrong county, didn't have the correct relationship with the respondent, was, were, was talking about a threat that was way in the past. Um, this is, I think people just didn't know what to do and just use, tried to follow, file an ERPO that had nothing to do with firearms. And some of them just did not have a preponderance of evidence. 
So it's it's not easy. And that's why we need such education and outreach in the future. Okay, next slide, please. Some people have talked about, well, if we have um, the domestic violence protection, which we, we do have domestic violence protection orders, um, why should we use ERPOs? And there's a difference. And what we're saying is that if there's a threat of gun violence, the potential victim should simultaneously file the domestic violence protection order and at the same time seek an ERPO. And we do know this sad note that a domestic violence victim is five times more likely to die if the abuser has access to a firearm. And that even means if the victim, potential victim is the owner of that firearm and the abuser has access to it. So we need both the ERPO and the DV to help save lives. Okay, next. There actually are lots of success stories around the country. And these are just a, a couple of ones that we've picked out to talk about. A man in Connecticut whose wife recently passed and was suicidal thanked the emergency, the EMTs who, and said, you saved my life. In Washington state, several respondents thanked the court for in for inter intervening, talking about the dark place they had been in Larimer Ca Sheriff's Office. An ERPO was filed on an inmate who was planning a mass shooting. And that's really scary. Um, and in Arapahoe County, a, a woman's husband had made threats on his own life and he agreed to the ERPO. In Maryland, a teen posed pictures of himself, himself, <laughs> And his AR-15 with words online, on social media, school shooter, and was stopped. So there are good things that have happened. And we have to work, since we have this new law, to make sure that we can have more ERPOs and more success stories. And next slide. There is research, I mean, there's research on everything, especially something like this. So um, uh, the two, 2017 Duke study examined results of Connecticut's firearms, firearms laws since they were the original one on, and, set, and found that seven, on average, seven guns were removed for, for each order, which talks about, to me, a lot of people don't just have one gun. They have a serious cache of guns. And one in three subjects given mental health care and drug and al alcohol counseling after the ERPO. So we have to remember that it's not just taking the guns away. It's looking to provide treatment or some kind of intervention for the person who, whose gun has been taken away. For every 10 to 20 orders, at least one suicide was prevented. And um, after the Virginia Tech shooting, the number of gun removals increased fivefold. So that to me is part of telling the story and making sure, and I know this is what the league wants to do, sharing this story with people around Colorado so that we don't have to go through another shooting to increase the number of gun removals. And Ann Schutz found that after a year, the most successful were, were filed with help of law enforcement. Again, we see this over and over again. Law enforcement knows how to file and other people don't, but this new law hopefully will change that because there's help in filing and more people included. Okay. Next. You're doing some of this already, but this is kind of our, my word to you and Colorado Ceasefire. Um, go online, 
coloradoceasefire.org, ERPO, or any place else you know to go and find this information. Ours is pretty thorough. Spread the word, talk to friends, colleagues, share handouts. We have handouts, but since we're on Zoom, we haven't gotten them to you, but we could um, if we figure out a way how to do that. Um, and go on social media to share this information. Host an informal meeting in your community. Again, invite Colorado Ceasefire to host a discussion on ERPO. We also have discussions, I mean, presentations on safe storage and the, on the history of gun laws in Colorado. We do, right now, we're, we have this grant from the Office of Gun Violence Prevention on presentations on ERPO. However, we do have, and I think um, safe storage is a really good one to go along with the ERPO. And help identify communities who can benefit from this information. I know you're doing that, so that, that's terrific. And last, I think we're at next to the last. Here's, um, if you have questions, go to coloradoceasefile.org or info at coloradoceasefile.org if you have either general questions or specific, I know somebody who's who's maybe I should file, file an ERPO, I don't know whether I should or shouldn't, we can't tell you yes or no, but we can help get you the information if you know someone who should be filing or you should be filing an ERPO. So those are things to keep in mind. There is help out there more than in the past. And, you know, things are slow. It was great to get the law passed originally and even greater to have extended, expanded it this year. Thank you. And we have time for some chat. Thank Excellent. you. Thank you. Um, uh, Rianda, would you like to handle the questions in the chat or shall I? Uh, let's see. I, I can. Here is, here's a question from Sue. Will educators and school administrators have ability to report beyond students? For example, if they have knowledge of a parent, ha, that may be an extreme risk. That's a good question. Um, I really do not know the answer to that. My, I know a guess, but I'm not going to guess on this one. That's a good question. I, I would suggest going to one of those resources to find out. Okay. And Anne says, are there consequences if a person who has a temporary ERPO obtain additional guns after his or her pre presently owned guns are removed? All right, so if, they, if their guns have been removed, is there a Indeed. consequence if they try to get them? Um, I've heard that question before. And it, it comes like, I've heard it like, oh, well, that person can just go to his friends and get another gun. That is true. I mean, that person could, it's not legal, but it could happen. Um, the Whoever filed, the only way that it has to go back to court. So the petitioner, the original filer or another filer who, who fall, falls in one of those categories, has to go back to court and start that process again. I don't know what the, I don't know what the, um, this is a civil process. It's not criminal. So I don't know what the consequence could be. It'd be contempt of court somehow, but I don't, that's all I know. Okay. And Ann also asks, what is the position or opinion of mental health organizations such as NAMI with regard to ERPO laws? They are mixed. I know when we, a lot of, not just ERPO laws, but other laws, um, the mental health community wants to make sure that people with mental health issues are not considered, uh, they're not all considered dangerous. In fact, more people with mental health issues are victims rather than perpetrators. So 
there is supposed to be a lot of um, protections and that's why it goes to this goes to court and has to be predominance of evidence and a judge i mean we're we're assuming that judges are uh, thoughtful in judging and lawyers are involved so i know it's mixed on all on many laws gun laws they and i think rightfully so that mental health wants to protect their clientele as they should and kathy asks if an erpo ruling is given and a sheriff does nothing can the sheriff be sued i don't think the sheriff can be sued but i i'm i the sheriff can be held in contempt of court it's a court order and not following a court order is contempt of court okay and pat says will resources be um, available or translated into spanish and other languages so yes it's, i don't know about how many other languages but spanish yes okay but the and, court I, wait courts have access to translators so depending on the county and depending on the court yes but not always okay good questions good questions and was funding for education written into the new urban law there was not you mean for education of about the populace not, yes not yeah, for the for everybody or for whomever yeah for whomever for yes no is the unfortunate answer however last year rianda you might know this or the year before when the office of gun violence prevention was established it's two years ago okay there are and now after a slow start there are grants from the office of gun violence prevention to spread the word we have a we, Colorado ceasefire has a grant for this and um i just talked to um St. Thomas Church in Denver, they got a grant to give out gun safety locks. Um, so there, that's how, and it's not nearly enough uh, money to really do what I think needs to be done. I've been thinking about um, schools since I used to be a teacher and had kids who went to school and grandkids. Um, so Colorado Ceasefire is talking to the Colorado Education Education Association. It seems like for all of those new categories, we have to start maybe at the top of those associations connected and then somehow get down to individual schools or whatever. And to me, this is not all volunteer. I mean, some of it's volunteer, but we it really needs a lot of thoughtfulness and money and funding to do a, the real job that needs to be done and kathy has her hand raised yeah it does i didn't feel like typing this in um <laughs> two things uh if they could get the tr the the any kind of training online that might be more efficient if you can, you know, somehow prove that they, you know, whoever it is, has watched the training, um, and it's and it's kind of specific to psychologists or teachers or whatever group it is. My other my other comment, and I think I said this in one other meeting. It was interesting at the beginning, toward the beginning of the legislative session. I heard an NPR segment. Um, a while back, and they were talking about ERPO laws. And in it, um, there was a law enforcement person that they had interviewed. And, and he said um, that he thinks some of his colleagues were reluctant um, to file because they really didn't know how they worked you know, and how to file correctly, and then what could happen. So we can't make the assumption 
that law enforcement knows this as well. You're right. They just knew better, but they <laughs> but we sure can't go 100%. And I think online has to be one of the ways to go, specifically mm -hmm. for like elementary school teachers. And then there would be a different one for mm -hmm. district attorneys or something. But right. I mean, we can't possibly do this all in person mm -hmm. for sure. Mm -hmm. And I, um, I know Colorado Ceasefire, we've been doing this a long time, but we certainly and can't do it all. And all of the, the Colorado Coalition Against Violence, you know, these are nonprofit, mostly volunteer organizations. We, can, we just, we, that whole group can't do it all. I mean, there has to be some serious implementation going on and I'm not aware of it yet. And it's, you know, it's only two weeks, but um, has to happen. And you had your hand up and you're muted. Sorry to ask so many questions. Um, do you know about the grants, if they will be available um, for the next fiscal year? And who would know the answer to that? Does anybody else know? I. So the grants come from the Office of Gun Violence Prevention. It is under the health department. And okay. that's where you would find out. I, I wanna believe, this was, I think this was their first series of grants. Yes, it was. And they had to be executed by, the grant the, had to be completed by the end of the fiscal year. And so my question is- The end of June. Again. Yeah. You don't know. They have money. I mean, I, got, I, I certainly hope the answer is yes. I don't know, but I know how to find it out. Okay, I'll, I'll investigate that. Thank you. Thanks, Anne. And Andrea? Yeah, just a thought that I wanted to um, I wanted to throw out. Excuse me. <laughs> um, getting back to the uh, discussion a little bit earlier about if somebody is under an ERPO and they go out and you know get a stash of guns that they may have had uh, stored with a friend or you know whatever the case may be, because this process mimics the um, the civil protection order process um, so much so for, you know, that that's the one that's used in domestic violence cases. Um, in those situations, if somebody's under an order, although it's a civil order, if they violate it, it can become a criminal offense. And if they're in violation of the order, then they can be arrested. So my inclination there is to think that you know, if the person that requested the order or if law enforcement, you know, has reason to believe that, um, you know, they have, um, you know, kind of circumvented it somehow and, you know, still have access to guns, I think there's a clear violation there. And I think, you know, if we're talking about an individual family member, or, you know, someone else in the community that had uh, petitioned for it, I would think that reporting to the police might be, um, you know, sufficient to, you know, potentially get the person arrested. Again, I'm kind of speculating here, just knowing that, you know, this process really follows very closely the civil protection order process, um, which is how violations are dealt with there. But it, it sort of seems to me like that might be a logical way that that would play out. Sounds logical. I'm just not sure. <laughs> Gloria, your hands up. Well, I had a question, but in following what Andrea just said, on the ERPO, is it understood, the person that's having the guns removed, that they have to surrender all the guns they have and that they are not allowed to possess guns until this matter is resolved? So that's set there. I mean, that's something they know, not that that will stop them. But then, as Andrea mentioned, then it becomes more of a criminal offense, correct? Because they're breaking that that uh, judge's order, that court order. I, I, I am not positive. I know for sure it's contempt of court. And one could be arrested for contempt of court. But I don't know if it's criminal. I really, I don't know. So, well, my question before though was about the 24 hour hotline. Is that also under the gun prevention um, uh, task force, the state task force 
for gun violence prevention, who's going to put that 24 hour hotline in? in I think it's the health department. Which is where that the which is yeah, but it might not be the Office of Gun Violence Prevention. Oh, okay, that's what I'm saying. So we could find out. That'd be something the league would be interested in finding out mm -hmm. to see. Yeah, and it hasn't happened yet. That's mm -hmm. part of the thing. So we could find out what the timeline is for it if we knew who. Oh, to you know what? To. I'm I'm sorry. I am reading my notes better than I did before. The Department of Public Safety is to establish a hotline. Okay. And um, I know that uh, ceasefire, once once this um, is established, we'll, we'll send that out to our mailing list. Kathy, your hand's up. And you're muted. I just saw that. Um, sorry about that. I have an analogy. In education, uh, we had the READ Act, which said that teachers and principals um, had to go through this training for early childhood literacy. They had to fund it. So perhaps the education element of this might be um, uh, legislation that the sponsors of the ERPA law this time around might introduce at the next legislative sessions uh, to fund to fund education. That sounds like a good idea. <laughs> so maybe yes. I mean you're you, you attend stakeholder, right? Stakeholder um, meetings with these legislators. Perhaps that's something you you can uh, suggest. Yeah, that's you're right. And um, you might talk to Ann McGeehan about that. Beth? Um, I just wanted to point out that the, I don't remember how many millions of dollars, but the gun violence prevent, the Office of Gun Violence Prevention received funding of millions of dollars. Yes, they did. And three so million. We, okay, <laughs> three million. So <laughs> some of us I counted. They, I, I know they had to hire a director and all that, but I guess what I'm saying is they only handed out about a handful of ten thousand dollar grants. They've got lots of money, and we they need do. for them to be putting these educational things together, and then we can work with them. But I don't think we need to take responsibility, like you said, Rita. You know, we're all volunteers, and we do have a coalition with ceasefire, moms to be in action. Um, you know, Giffords now is very active in our in our state. We know we can work on this with the Office of Gun Violence Prevention. Yes. They need yes. to be education. We need to pressure them to right. really provide education on ERPO. That's right. Be, and I think they even said that was originally one of their number one priorities. So we need to hold their feet to the fire on that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, at first, it took them a long time to get their first grants out of the door. And we all knew they had millions of dollars. It was very frustrating, hopefully. And $10,000 grants don't buy a lot. So hopefully- yeah, I guess I just want to- Yeah. I guess my my main point, I guess, is I hear all these great ideas. They are. But let's let's start where the money is, <laughs> you know. And absolutely, knowing that we're all volunteers, you know, let's let's start there. So maybe that's what we should do: is try to pull our coalition together to really, really get in touch with that. I think that's great. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks. So I will um, bring your ideas back to ceasefire, and um, you. I know it on this call there's some uh, moms demand action people. I don't know what who else has represented it. Rionda, you're at the coalition, so we should just talk to whoever we can talk to about pressuring them. I mean, absolutely. I know I, somehow I thought they had a new director or they were getting a new director or something, but I'm not even sure about that. But there was so much frustration that nothing happened. Um, so we have to push because that's not good enough anymore. Yeah, I agree. They should be within, you know, 
they're the ones they have the 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 guys yeah yep okay any more questions rita thank you very much this this was really informative thank you you're quite welcome and thank you for all the work you do and um let's just keep it up let's do that (laughs) everybody all right thanks everyone chins up and thank you Thank you, Rionda. Thank you.